It is week 11 of my Summer with Lisa Kleypas challenge, and this week we are doing Love in the Afternoon, many people's very favorite Hathaway book. Hi, I'm B. welcome to my channel, Mama Needs to Read Romance, because nobody in this book is going to rock my world by starting third grade in a week. Yes, we are in the final book of the Hathaway series, Love in the Afternoon. And for many people, as I said, it's their very favorite book. I am excited to read this, especially it's the last week of summer. I can't even believe it. We'll be reading this in between doing tons and tons of last minute summer slash school starting type things. <clears throat> By the way, I'm still getting over being sick, so I apologize for that. And we'll see how well this vlog goes. <laughs> still getting over it but it's so much better, thank heavens. We have Beatrix, it's finally her time to shine, finally her book, and she's quirky, she's cool, she's into nature, and she's in love with someone via mail. <laughs> it's really cool, actually. The first time I read this book, I literally could not sleep at night. I was like, I'm not reading anymore. And then I spent two hours in bed just thinking about like, when is Christopher gonna find out that Beatrix is the one writing the letters? From what I remember the last time I read this book, Beatrix, she has a friend named Christopher. Christopher thinks of Beatrix as an odd duck, and then he goes away to war. And Beatrix's best friend, Prudence, is as shallow as they come and does not feel like writing back Christopher. And so Beatrix starts to do it for her because Beatrix wants to give some advice about a dog. It starts out very innocently, but over time, Beatrix starts to develop a real affection for Christopher. Only Christopher thinks that she's Prudence. And oh my heavens, this book, so intense, so exciting, so much fun. And I just can't wait to share it with you. In this vlog, I'm going to give spoilers after this part. I'm gonna be reading a little bit every day and then sharing with you what I discover. And I will also at the end rate it. And I will let you know what I believe is the love theme of Beatrix and Christopher. Why? Because I enjoy it. <laughs> so in any case, I hope you're ready to share in the fun with me. And yeah, I guess here we go. Let's just get started. So sorry. <laughs> I gotta do this while I can. And yes, I am feeling better. It's day 11 of COVID. I don't know if it's even COVID anymore. It's just recovery. I just have to, this is taking forever. It's ridiculous. But anyway, their dad has them out for breakfast with Grammy and grandpa. And I'm taking advantage before they come back and uh, telling you about the first four chapters of this book. Yes, this is two novels in one. So you saw me last week looking fabulous and holding this. And that was when I was reading Married by Morning. But now I'm reading the second book in this, Love in the Afternoon. There's two books. Anyway, okay, so back to this. <laughs> first four chapters. We have Beatrix and she is good friends with Prudence, who is about as shallow as they come. And there's another gentleman in this story named Christopher Phelan, who is also extremely shallow. And he is very into parties and women and carousing. And he purchased a um, place in the military, basically so he could wear the uniform and look cute, because it works with the ladies, especially the shallow ones like Prudence. Not so much Beatrix, who doesn't really like Christopher very much because he once made a comment to a friend which she overheard, there was something like, she's better suited to the stables than the ballroom. And that really hurt Beatrix's feelings. Although, I mean, it's true. She is kind of a semi-wild creature. She is just, she's more into animals than people. And I think her family's already relegating her to spinsterhood. Actually, that's Beatrix's concern. She wants to find a man who's just got that special something who is just going to overtake her, she says. And that's certainly gonna happen in this book. So here's where it gets really interesting though. So we've got Prudence who gets a letter from Christopher and he is now, he's one of the rifle brigade. He's basically a sniper and his world is being completely changed. He thought he was just gonna be going around London dressed in a uniform, but now he's a rifleman and he's in the Crimea during the war. 
And he writes Prudence to get some sort of sense of normalcy and to express feelings to her and talk about what's going on with him. And she couldn't care less. She has other guys on the side. She only wants him if he comes back from war completely intact because she doesn't want to push around some guy in a wheelchair. This girl is the worst. Thank goodness for Beatrix who wants to help Christopher in writing a letter back to him because he part of his letter is about a dog that was left behind by one of his fellow army men who had passed away. So now Christopher has this dog who's really belligerent and Beatrix writes to him as Prudence just to give him some advice. It's very innocent. She just wants to help him out. But over the course of these first four chapters, their letters become very um, personal and special and she helps him to feel better. And the two of them pass along back and forth these beautiful words, just expressing their likes and dislikes about life and I mean, literature, they're very deep and he starts to really fall for her. Well, his sister-in-law who is dealing with her own grief, uh, Christopher's brother is dying of consumption and Audrey, who is Christopher's sister-in-law, she is watching as her husband passes away. Audrey is aware by the end of chapter four that Beatrix is the one writing the letters as Prudence. And Audrey realizes that, you know, obviously Beatrix is so much better of a person than Prudence, but because Christopher believes that Prudence is the one writing the letters, Audrey says, if she ends up my sister-in-law, it's gonna be your fault. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, Audrey's so busy with the, her grief over her husband passing away, which he does at the end of chapter four, she really doesn't have any time to worry about Beatrix and gives her free reign even in the house where Beatrix accidentally steals Christopher's shaving brush. So her kleptomania is back because she's nervous. And at the end of the fourth chapter, you know, she decides, look, I can't do this anymore. This is getting very, very personal. I've fallen in love with him. He's fallen in love with me, but he thinks that I'm Prudence. What in the world am I gonna do? So she writes two letters, one basically saying, look, we just need to be friends. This is too much. Let's just correspond as friends for the rest. And maybe you don't write me. <laughs> the other one is the letter that she, of course, doesn't intend to send, but is actually the words of her heart, which is something that's shared at the very first page of this book. It says, Dearest Christopher, I can't write to you again. I'm not who you think I am. I didn't mean to send love letters, but that is what they became. On their way to you, my words turned into heartbeats on the page. Come back, please. Please come home and find me, unsigned. And here's the problem. She accidentally sends that letter as opposed to the one that she meant to send, which was to say, let's just be friends and let's just maybe not correspond until you're back. She realizes that letter is going to Christopher. Duh, duh, duh. Getting back into the swing of things, but still not taking the time to put makeup on because I don't want to do any bit of exertion of energy that I can't spare. So boys are back at therapy. I'm hanging out, having a chance. I also looked at some books. Man, am I getting into the Target book thing. I just fell in love with a book recently I'm going to do in my August reading wrap up. I cannot wait to talk about it. And then I just got a new one. Oh, I'm excited about this one too. Anyway, real quick. Let's talk music before we talk about chapters five through eight. I know what song I want to be the song for Christopher and Beatrix, and it is Safe and Sound by the Civil Wars and Taylor Swift. It's so perfect because Beatrix helps him to feel a sense of safety again after the war. Now let's talk chapters four through eight, excuse me, five through eight. <clears throat> Christopher comes back from the war. Oh, before he comes back, he has been injured and he actually is helping some soldiers as they pass away and just taking care of people until he becomes too sick to do so. He gets a letter, he gets the letter from Beatrix, you know, the one that I alluded to in the last segment about come back and find me, I'm not who you think I am, as well as a letter from his sister-in-law saying that his brother will likely have passed by the time he's read the letter. So he comes back from the war, highly, highly decorated. Everybody's looking for him. He's nowhere to be found. He does not want to be part of the pomp and circumstance. Uh, not too long after that, we discover, oh, we go back to the Ramsey house. Rye is now four and a half year, years old. That is the oldest son of Amelia and Cam. They even have another son now named Alex, who is a baby. 
and Alex is missing Yadro, his cousin, who is Wynn and Kev's son. He is abroad with his parents. They're in Ireland checking out the new land or the land that will be Kev's once he inherits from his grandfather. So that's pretty cool that they're doing that. And of course there's craziness around with the animals that are running through Beatrix's home. But one day she's going through the forest and she discovers Albert, the dog that she wrote to and from Christopher about. So she knows Christopher is nearby. Well, Christopher's pretty rude to her upon their first meeting and he's brash. I mean, he's not, he's got so many issues. He's so stressed out and uh, he heads back to his house where his mother is totally disinterested in him. All she wants is to die along with her firstborn who just passed away. And his sister-in-law is obviously in terrible, terrible shape. So it's pretty depressing over there. And obviously he's not in a very good mood and Albert won't stop barking. He's barking at everything in the world. Anyway, um, Audrey, his sister-in-law tells him that he needs to be polite to Beatrix and he needs to go back to that house and apologize. And they have a very interesting conversation about the differences between Prudence and Beatrix. And Audrey makes no secret of the fact that she really dislikes Prudence and that Prudence is now more interested in Christopher because now he's got He's going to inherit land and he's a highly decorated officer and he would look good in a uni uniform and that's all that Prudent Prudence cares about. Audrey says there's something that you need to know, but I'm not going to tell you. You need to figure it out for yourself, which is of course the fact that Beatrix has been writing letters as Prudence, but Audrey's not going to tell him. If I had been Audrey, there's no way I would have been able to sit on that information. So I guess good on you, Audrey, for being able to keep a secret. No way on the planet I could have done that. I would have told him within the first day of him arriving. <laughs> Probably I never could have held that in. So he goes over to their home. Beatrix is actually in trousers, which drives Christopher up a wall. He's again, not very pleasant. He's just so persnickety and he it does find himself though attracted to Beatrix and they have a nice little afternoon of tea, but you know, he's just, he's aimless. He doesn't know what to do with his life. He's really unhappy. And when she asks him what his talents are, like what he's gonna try to do now, he says, my biggest talent is killing. Just like, yikes, what a way to end a conversation and also a chapter, chapter eight. So that's where we will leave today. And then we will continue with chapter nine in the next segment. Oh man, still trying to keep the energy up and recovering, finishing up, but we got stuff to do to get ready for school next week, so we're getting it done. Let's talk a little bit more about music. So in this book, Beatrix mentions to Christopher that her favorite song is Over the Hills and Far Away, which Christopher writes back to her and says, that is the official song of their rifle brigade. I found the song, I've got it linked below, along with paintings of the British army at that time. It's so cool. So if you have a minute, check it out. All right. Now I just finished at chapter 14. I think I did chapters nine through 14 today. So here's what happened. Beatrix goes over to Christopher's house to tell him she wants to work with Albert to help train him. And as she's talking to him, Albert causes a kerfuffle and Christopher using his reflexes that he learned in the war thinks that there's danger so he leaps on her to protect herself and him self and they have this incredibly intimate beautiful sweet moment where she just remembers how much she loves him and he feels so safe and just so attracted to her and it's really a beautiful moment she's like rubbing the nape of his neck and then he just sort of apologizes and he's super embarrassed and he feels like maybe he shouldn't even be with Prudence. And Audrey has echoed the sentiment too, like he may not be fit to be a husband for anyone with his PTSD. I mean, it's possible. So he winds up going to London though for the season to see Prudence and to sell his commission in the army. And he does see Prudence and it's crazy. Like he's so excited to see her, but she's not acting right. She doesn't understand the con, like whenever he references the letters, she seems kind of confused and it's just not the way he was hoping that it would be. Meanwhile, back in Hampshire, 
Beatrix takes Albert off of the hands of the help over at uh, Riverton and all of the people that are working there are thrilled to get that dog off their hands. <laughs> so Christopher's gonna find out later. But he, at a certain point, he talks about the quintessence and how Beatrix talked about how everybody has a little starlight in them. And Prudence had no idea what he was talking about. And at that moment, he realized for sure, this is not the woman that wrote the letters. He felt like he was going crazy because he kept trying to feel things with her that just weren't there. And then he realized it's not her. And Audrey re refused to tell him who it was because she was afraid that he would hurt Beatrix. And so he's told Prudence that he's gonna go ahead and try to court her, but it's a front. He's, he's feeling like they've played a game with him and he's gonna get back at her whoever she is, no matter what. And he's furious with Prudence, he's mad at Audrey, like they were all playing him. And I have to say, I think he kind of has a point. I mean, it makes me a little bit sad that he's going through everything he's been going through and nobody's being open and honest with him. I mean, I can see why they're not, but at the same time, I mean, I do feel badly for him. He just feels like people are stringing him along and, and not being forthright. So I get both sides, but I'm a little nervous because man, does he, he's out for blood. And I don't want Beatrix to be on the receiving end of that. So we'll see what happens in chapter 14. There are so many school things going on right now that I can only do this really fast in a corner, basically, while the kids watch Paw Patrol so much open house and meeting teachers and kindergarten play dates and all that. So I'm just doing this while I can. All right, chapters 14 through 17. It gets crazy right now, folks. I mean, crazy. So we've got Christopher, he's back from London and he discovers that Albert is gone. He spent months with Beatrix and the Hathaways and he's mad and his servants are not. <laughs> and he's mad that they don't care. They're just thrilled to have gotten rid of Albert. He gets to the Hathaways, he's so furious and then he discovers that Albert is really in great shape he looks fabulous his color his color his his he's gained weight his his coat is shiny and he's mad at beatrix but he's he's attracted to her he cannot help himself and he finds himself being dragged to dinner where he's like i don't want to talk to anybody and beatrix says well he doesn't want to talk to anyone and they all basically they think that's totally normal and fine they're like oh great well then you can just enjoy our wit <laughs> they're so hilarious and leo and Catherine are there with the twins and just seeing them the four of them so happy together this happy little family it's just so heartwarming so i'm just so happy for them and it's interesting here's what here's when it starts to get really crazy so they talk about beatrix and all her animals and then they mention hector which is the name of the mule that Beatrix recently acquired, which was what Christopher said was the name of his mule when he was growing up, when he was doing letters with Prudence. And he's like, what did you say? Or they said the, do the mule's name was Hector. And it was like, oh no, he's, he's on to her. So he asks if after dinner, she can walk him into the stables to meet Hector. And then they have this incredible encounter. He knows that there's something going on with the letters and she doesn't want to tell him because she's a little scared. And also she feels like it's just his pride. So <clears throat> she doesn't want to share anything else, but man, do they do some major kissing and it is hot. And he's just so confused about his feelings for her and just in general with what's going on. And he's, he just leaves kind of in a huff. <laughs> I mean, and she's in a huff too. So fast forward a bit. They are at Stony Cross Park for a ball. Lord Westcliff is dancing with, I think, Catherine. I'm trying to remember which one he's dancing with. But he's just, you know, he wants everybody to think of the Hathaways as just as good as anybody else, even though they have two Roms in their family. It's so cool to be back at Stony Cross Park. And uh, also, uh, Beatrix gets to dance with Lord Chattering, I think his name is. And uh, Christopher notices, and you can tell he's a smidge jealous. He's talking with Prudence, and then Prudence talks with Beatrix, and Prudence is like, we're almost betrothed. And Beatrix is like, that's great, why don't you go tell someone else? And then she starts watching Christopher and realizes he's sweating and like acting really nervous. So she pulls him aside and, and she, she pretends that he's gonna look at portraits with her, but really she takes him to the conservatory because it's quiet because she realizes he's like a trapped animal right now. 
Like my arm is getting tired, sorry. Oh, that's better. Anyway, she decides that um, she wants to help him because she, like I said, she feels like he's like a trapped animal. So she, the two of them are just quiet and he's sweating and she gets a handkerchief and she's just trying to be helpful and he's being kind of sarcastic and frustrating and and he's like, how could I not like Prudence? And she's like, if you're gonna be like that, then I'm leaving. And he goes like, well then fine, go. And she, <laughs> and I'm like, just go Beatrix, this guy's nothing. I don't know if he's right for you. But um, she's like, oh, he look in her mind, she's thinking how adorable he looks. So she decides to stay. And then she actually, she tells him she understands his mental issues more than he thinks because she has kleptomania. And she explained to him that she's actually taken two of his things. <laughs> and he finds that sort of endearing. And when she leaves later, he says, I want my cuffling back. Or I want my shaving brush back. Those are the two things that she has. So, sorry, that's my bird clock. <laughs> Ignore. And there you are. So then we get to a, a little further on. It's it's the following couple weeks. She hasn't heard from him at all, and Albert shows up at the house. Well, it turns out after everything happened, um, Christopher was not in good shape. When I say after everything happened, after the ball, I think it was just too much for him. So he's basically drinking himself into a stupor, and Beatrix finds this out when she returns Albert to their home. And she's very concerned. In fact, one of the servants expresses concern that he might do harm to himself and they're very worried about him but he's the only like owner there if that makes sense both of the feelings the mrs feelings are not there it's just christopher and all the servants and they can't really tell him what to do so beatrix decides she's going to go up to his room which is such a great idea and he's like why are you here i mean he's wearing nothing but trousers that are open and uh he's like get out or get in my bed such a gentleman. But I mean, I know he's going through a lot and he's semi-drunk. Um, basically, she does, refuses to leave and then he gets her on the bed with him and they have uh, quite an intimate moment before she decides. She's like, let's just go on with it then. And she turns over onto her stomach and he's like, what are you doing? And she says, well, this is how squirrels do it. And he's like, what? <laughs> and so she only knows mating habits of animals. And so she doesn't really understand what, what people do. And he just found it so funny. But basically, that sort of broke the tension. And then they just have this great conversation on, on the bed. And he's confiding in her that he's afraid that he's never going to heal and recover. And he doesn't know who he is anymore. He knows he's not the man he was before the war. And he knows he's not the man he was during the war. But he doesn't know who he is now. And, you know, she's very understanding. I mean, she's always so good to him. And it's just so wonderful. But here's where it gets especially crazy. She says, love forgives all things. And he's like, what did you say? Because that's exactly what she said in the letter. And she's, he goes, I knew it. And she knows that he knows. And he knows that she knows that he knows. And she bolts out of that room as fast as she can and tells uh, one of the servants to make sure if, they, if he wants to get on his horse, which she assumes he will, to go slowly, like to saddle up the horse slowly so she can have a running start because it's about to go down. He knows that she wrote those letters. So here we go. been three days since I filmed anything because I've just been so exhausted and I think I'm still doing as poorly as I am at day 16 of COVID. It's, I guess, recovery at this point, but I've been just too tired to do all the things I need to do to get the kids ready for school and also film. <clears throat> There's just no energy left and you should see the state of my house. Oh my gosh, it's crazy. Open houses, getting forms, talking to teachers, emails, medical stuff. Uh, two of my kids have some food allergies. So there's like a whole other layer of, of things. <laughs> so it's pretty crazy. Anyway, let's get back to it. I'm going to do three segments in the same day. So you're going to see this lovely shirt, but it's perfect because it's the last Hathaways. So got to wear the shirt and yeah, you're just going to see the shirt a lot. <laughs> so I'm sorry. So to the book. Let's talk about chapter 17 through 20. So as you may remember from just a second ago, Christopher discovered for sure that it was Beatrix who wrote the note, <clears throat> the notes, the letters. 
and he takes off after her and he finds her in that secret little old house that is in the middle of the woods that actually belongs to Lord the Lord Westcliff, Earl of Westcliff. <clears throat> and and Albert led Christopher right to Beatrix and he ascends the stairs and it's insanely dramatic. I mean, I can't do it justice. You've got to read chapter 17. He gets up those stairs and he's just staring at her and basically you know, she admits it and she's so emotional. He's kind of stoic at first, but he needs to know, like, does she still love him? And she says, yes. And he says, I love you. And I think it's the earliest I've seen anyone profess, like a guy profess their love in one of these books. Usually it's more towards the end, but he right, comes right out and says it. You're the one I love, not Prudence. I wondered why it didn't seem right. Now I understand. And they start expressing their feelings physically to one another. And she would like to go all the way, but he's like, no, we're not, we're not doing that. Um, you're a virgin and this is kind of crazy. And yeah, we're not going to do that right now. <clears throat> and unfortunately, you know, the other thing I'm like, Beatrix, why are you pushing this so fast and hard? But, um, she wants to get married like right now. And it's kind of, I'm like, okay, you've known each other in person for a few weeks, but I guess through the letters and everything they've been through, she feels like it would be good for them to get married. And he does not want to marry her because he is afraid of himself. He knows that he can be uh, full of rage and he's still getting over having been in the war. He's snapped at people. He's lashed out at people. He's been physically aggressive without even really meaning to. And he said, look, if we do this, I can't even sleep in a bed with you. Um, I have real reservations about this, but I do love you, but I want to protect myself or protect you from me. So later on, he ends up at the Ramsey house and he starts to really develop a rapport with them over these four chapters. He and Leo especially are kind of like two peas in a pod. And Christopher really needs a sense of family and the Hathaways provide that to him in spades. And I love it when he wanted to formally talk to Cam and Leo about getting married to Beatrix. And he said, well, who should I speak to? Because Cam and Leo seem to share the uh, the burden of being the head of the household equally. And they both point to one another. And in the same time, they say him, <laughs> which I thought was so funny. I love the Hathaways so much. Um, yeah, so they, they, so here's the thing. I found myself a lot of the time trying to, just not just sort of forgive Christopher some of his flaws because I know he's had a rough go of it. Uh, but remember, before the war, he was pretty arrogant and he was not the greatest guy around. He will admit to that. And I think a lot of it was he felt like he had no choice but to be the bad boy because everybody loved his older brother, John, and everybody was just sort of saying he was, that Christopher was like his dad and his dad was like this cad. Oh, dad, cad. Anyway, um, so, I mean, Christopher wasn't perfect. And... Still, like I feel badly for Beatrix because she's so understanding and she's so sweet and he keeps coming around. It's like, I'm going to be the head of the household and you can't do certain things with animals. And I mean, he doesn't quite say it like that, but he's very domineering and he wants to be in charge and he wants to be the head. And <clears throat> I thought, well, you know what? It's just this, it's the times that they're living in. That's why. But um, upon further reflection, I don't feel like I've gotten that impression from any of the even more like alpha types. Like Maripen would never have said that to Win, for example, and he's one of the most alphas around. So yeah, I just had a little bit of trouble because Beatrix is such a free spirit. I get that maybe she needs to be reined in, but I don't know. I mean, I, I really feel conflicted about Christopher trying to be too controlling of her. I don't know, I feel sort of protective of her and I just want her to get to be her fullest, truest, most beautiful self and I just don't want him to squash any of that. So anyway, I mean, he talks about how they're gonna move to Riverton and she'd miss her family and um, you know, she, but she's excited to try a new adventure but at the same time she has some reservations but he's like, well, we're gonna do it. <laughs> and then the worst of it is towards the end, he, she surprises him and he grabs her around the throat and pins her against a wall without even thinking. So, I mean, there's proof right there that he's right, that he, she's not quite safe with him. Of course, you know, cause she's around wild, crazy animals all the time. She doesn't feel like he's a problem. And I should also say in this chapter too, he had told her he didn't want her doing 
more aggressive things with animals, like if there was a wild animal trying to tame it, etc. And then he comes upon her when she is being flung off of a horse that she's trying to break in, which is absolutely what he asked her not to do. And they start arguing and he just leaves. And so he's furious with her. And then he later on feels badly. He's like, well, maybe I shouldn't, you know, make her uh, be tamed too quickly. It's interesting too, because right after he pins her to the wall, they start having a heart to heart and they wind up making love her, her first time. And she says, you know, she feels like she tamed him or maybe it was the other way around. It's kind of an interesting uh, idea. And then um, he realizes that he's trembling. He thought that she was the one trembling after they finished making love, but it was him. So you can see that there's a lot of emotion going on and it was very cathartic for him. And I obviously for her, it was extremely good. She was very excited to finally go through with it. Um, yeah. So I just have mixed feelings. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. All right, let's talk chapters 21 through 24 and marvel as B continues to be conflicted about their relationship. So Christopher decides he's gonna take care of her. She says she's gonna go home and he says, no, she's not going home because he's telling her what to do. He carries her upstairs. I mean, it's sort of romantic. There goes my bird clock again. I am so sorry, <laughs> this video. <clears throat> anyway, oh, bird clock. I mean, it's fun. It's not right now. Okay. so. He carries her upstairs. They get a hip bath going. He gets champagne sent up. Who wouldn't love this? Who wouldn't? He starts giving her a bath and then he starts pleasuring her and it's beautiful. Except that then, again, sorry, I don't want to ruin this for anybody if anybody just thinks this is terribly romantic. But the thing that bothers me about this, again, is he starts making love to her and she even says, like, I'm sore because we just did it the first time like an hour ago. And he's like, oh, it'll be fine. And I'm like, oh, again, like in all the other Lisa Kleypas historical romances, I can't think of a single other time where the, the gentleman hasn't even been like, you know what, we just did it. So you're gonna be sore, so let's not. But not Christopher. Christopher's like, you'll be fine. And I'm just like, come on. So anyway, I just found that a little frustrating. So I apologize if this is ruining the romance for you guys, but because I'm sure some people think it's lovely and beautiful that he just can't contain his love for her. Yeah, but anyway, for me, mm -mm. moving along, uh, he goes back to the house. He gets to meet Maripen for the first time. Oh, this is during uh, mid-September now. Most of it's been in August, which is so cool because this is August right now. So now we're into mid-September. It's the hot ticket of the season, the Ramsey Ball. And Maripen and Winter back. We finally get to see Maripen. He seems to be absent for a lot of the subsequent books after Seduce Me at Sunrise. I'm not sure why. Maybe because he's such a complicated character. I mean, we see so much of Leo and Cam throughout, but like Maripen, and I don't think I even saw Harry once in this book. So anyway, <clears throat> but I digress. So Maripen says, I haven't decided if you can have Sorry, there's another, I was almost said Haven. That's another book I'm reading by Lisa Claypus right now. And they're also all dominating men. That's Blue Eyed Devil, which I'll talk about in another video. So Mary Penn says, I haven't decided if you can have Beatrix. And Christopher says, well, I'll let her keep all her animals. And Mary Penn says, you can have her, which I thought actually was pretty funny. So they have a lovely time at the ball. Um, and Beatrix gets to meet Annandale, who is Christopher's grandfather. And it was really humorous. She kind of, she called him an eagle. You know, she talks to, about how people are all an animal. She relates them to a particular animal based on their character traits. And she referred to Annandale as an eagle. And oh my gosh, did Annandale love that. They hit it off spectacularly. It was so cute. And Annandale confided in Christopher afterwards that he actually had loved a girl like Beatrix, but went with a prudence instead and that he regretted it his whole life. And I thought that was really cool that uh, that his, grand I mean, I was sad for the grandfather, but I thought that was very interesting that he imparted that to Christopher and let Christopher realize just how good he had it, which I thought was really great. Um, there was a bit of a scandal at the ball. Leo was flirting with a woman, his wife, which I thought was so cute. I love Leo and Catherine so much. And Leo then gave a beautiful toast talking about the upcoming wedding of Beatrix and 
Christopher, and then someone else wants to give a toast, that would be Annandale, who's got a surprise announcement. Christopher's going to get the Victoria Cross from the Queen herself for saving Colonel, I think it's Colonel Fenwick, which was just about the worst news Christopher could get. He doesn't want to be reminded of the war. He doesn't want awards for some of the worst moments of his life. And he actually hated Colonel Fenwick. So uh, this is all terrible. And it's bringing up some really bad memories, which he shares with Beatrix, such as he saved Colonel Fenwick because Colonel Fenwick looked like he would live. Whereas Mark Bennett, who was a dear friend of Christopher's, he was dying. He had like an open chest wound and Christopher knew that he wouldn't make it. So he had Albert stay with Mark as he was dying and then went and rescued Colonel Fenwick instead. And uh, yeah, so he does not want to get a, an award. He does not want to be in front of a bunch of people. And it's it's upsetting to him. So, um, you know, speaking of hard times too, a little bit of a transition here, Mara Penn and Wynn were discussing their trip abroad to Ireland and just how dr difficult it is over there that Mara Penn and Cam's grandfather has, they've pretty much neglected the tenants of, of Mara Penn's future lands and the good news is Cam and Mara Penn are gonna work together to really get those families back on top again. So good news for them. And of course you would never expect anything less from Mara Penn who is like the get it done guy. So I thought that was great. The final chapter I'm gonna talk about, chapter 24, is the actual wedding. What a beautiful wedding, what a beautiful wedding. There's no elephant in this one, unlike a Hathaway wedding, which Leo actually alludes to the elephant that Beatrix had. And I, the first time I read this book, I didn't, I hadn't read a Hathaway wedding. I didn't even know it existed. So when he mentioned the elephant, I was like, when did that happen? And then reading a Hathaway wedding, I'm like, oh, there's the elephant. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty neat. But the wedding, just beautiful, an early autumn wedding in the countryside. You've got everybody, they've parked their carriages uh, blocks down so they walk up the paths lined with flowers and all the women are on one side of the street, all the men on the other side. Women are, there's um, Hector the mule is up front. They also, of course, Albert is in the wedding as well but Hector has a, a little straw hat on and baskets of flowers that the women are tossing petals as they go along. And it was just such a beautiful wedding. I loved it. I mean, often there's not a lot of weddings, honestly, in these books. They sort of jump to the epilogue where somebody's gonna have a baby. But I loved a good wedding scene. And I just, it was beautiful. And I'm just so happy for them. And oh my gosh, it gets even better. So they go back to her secret house. She thought they were gonna spend their honeymoon night on at, at his home. And instead he's like, I've got a surprise for you. So they go to her little secret hideaway in Lord Westcliff's lands. And Christopher had spoken to Marcus about it and said, would it be okay if I decorated? And Marcus is like, that's great. It's like suited with beautiful pillows and rugs and a bed and it's just gorgeous. There's candlelight and chilled champagne and all kinds of delicious things to eat on the table. I mean, it just sounds like absolute heaven. And you know, they're both up there in their wedding finery. It's just so beautiful. I love it so much. And then she she starts trying to make love to him immediately. She's so excited. He's like, hold on a second. And she hears singing. And I love this scene so much. She looks out the window. It's the same window where she lit candles for Christopher so many nights. And standing below are all the men of his uh, groom's party. And he, they're wearing their uniforms and they're singing over the hills and far away, which you may remember I have linked, I mentioned I have linked below. So you can hear it if you want. I loved it so much. I just picture her like leaning out the window in her wedding dress, listening to them sing with Christopher smiling in the background. It's just such a beautiful, beautiful moment. And then of course they have, they make love and it's beautiful and they have, they eat some delicious cold dinner that was prepared for them and yeah, I mean, it was just lovely. Unfortunately, the chapter ends on a sour note, though, because as she's ready to fall to sleep in his arms in their bed, he moves to the floor and he's like, I'll be fine. Don't worry. I've slept in worse places. And so she is not happy, but he's terrified that he's going to wake up with a night terror and he's going to hurt her, which I get that, but she is not happy. So unfortunately, it's like the chapter ends with, and she left him on the floor to deal with his demons. The end of the chapter. Kind of uns unsettling. Well, 
let's talk about the end of the book. Chapter 25 through the end. I can't believe we're here already. Oh my gosh, it's crazy. So, and it's the end of the Hathaways. Oh, but thank goodness for Walt. I was going to say wallflowers. Thank goodness for the Raven Elves starting next week. I'm really excited about that. Sorry. I'm trying to stay on track. It's been a crazy week. Back to the Hathaways. Last four chapters. So they're on their honeymoon. It's beautiful. They're in a thatch roof cottage. Again, there's this huge bone of contention between the two of them because she is not happy that he will not sleep in bed with her. And he is not giving in and neither is she apparently. She is just not understanding. And I sort of wish that she would be a little more understanding. They're just both kind of stubborn. So they're gonna have to feel this out. This is gonna be, there's gonna be a lot of communication needed I think as time goes on. Uh, but I would say one of the craziest thing that happens is he finds out that Colonel Fenwick is nearby. So he goes to see him because Fenwick has been asking about him. And it turns out, so Fenwick, honestly, you know what this reminds me of? It reminds me of Forrest Gump, Lieutenant Dan, how he wanted to die on the battlefield for the glory because he was a long line of you know ancestors who had passed in battle. And that's all he felt like he could contribute to the world, I guess. <clears throat> so uh, honestly, Fenwick is exactly the same way. He wanted to die in battle. He wants glory. He wants to be remembered. And he feels like Christopher will be. And now Fenwick's going to be nothing. And he's so bitter about it. I wish this guy could seek some therapy or something because I feel so badly for him if he could just change his outlook. But he is very bitter. And he hates the fact that Christopher doesn't even want the medal. And, and it's for saving Fenwick. But he also has some really, really crazy news to share, which is Mark Bennett did not die. He was taken by the Russians and then they tried to keep him rather than just trade him in negotiations because he found out that Bennett was part of the, um, he had a fortune in his family. So they were hoping to get more money out of him. And Bennett finds, winds up fleeing from prison. He escapes and he's been on the run and guess who he's looking for? Christopher. And he wants to kill Christopher because he believes that Christopher left him to die and that Christopher is now this glorious war hero, whereas Bennett is this shell of a man. And Christopher's terrified because he knows what Fenwick says. It's just like, oh, great. He's so nice. He says, you better find him before he finds you, which is just terrifying. So Christopher rushes home and he sees Beatrix. It's mid-November, it's windy, it's such a beautiful picture. She's wearing a, like a maroon colored um, cape with a hood and it's blowing in the wind. And she's sort of laughing as he rides in and she, he feels so, um, so happy that she's safe. And then he hears a shot ring out and this is not from his nightmares. He falls off of his horse, Mark Bennett is there and he wants to kill Christopher. And, and Christopher gets Beatrix behind him to protect her, but Mark is just talking about how, you know what, if, if, our, if our roles had been reversed, I would have killed Fenwick and taken you, even if you were dying. And, you know, because Christopher said, I couldn't leave Fenwick because he knew everything. The Russians would have tortured all the information out of him. And it was just so sad. But the long, long story short, too late, is, that Beatrix, again, being the incredible soul that she is, sees Bennett as a wounded animal. And they wind up taking him in and feeding him and, and listening to him and just loving on him and letting him go on horse rides and get sunshine and fresh air. And they bring him back to life. And I just thought, Beatrix, man, you are taking on a lot. You got Christopher and Bennett now, <clears throat> which is just crazy. And an interesting little twist, Audrey, you know, uh, Christopher's stepsister, his, you know, the, of course, his brother, John, has passed at this point. Audrey comes by and stays with them for a fortnight, which I've read is two weeks. And she and Bennett sort of hit it off. And Bennett said, I actually told her that I'm impotent because of the war. <laughs> he said, are you? And he goes, no. <laughs> but she was so nervous around me. So I told her that and that made it better. Well, towards the end of the epilogue, which I have to say is one of my favorite epilogues of all time, we find out that Audrey and Bennett are now sort of seeing one another officially. So they're, they're going to be happy together. I'm just so thrilled for them. When we jump into the epilogue, by the way, it is at Hyde Park. Christopher is going to be receiving his Victoria Cross medal from the Queen. She is on horseback. Uh, it, they've got everybody there, including Highlanders. I heard them say, I was like, Highlanders? That makes me want to read a Highlander book, which I'm going to be doing soon. I'm excited about that. And 
Anyway, sorry, I'm the worst this week. My apologies, you guys are the best for listening. <laughs> It's just such a long week. My brain. Back to the thing, back to what we're talking about. Albert is there. The queen gives Albert a medal on a collar, which I just thought was the neatest thing. I was so excited for that. And you know, it all worked out beautifully. Bennett was there. Everyone is just healthy and happy. And there's so much love with all the Hathaways. It's just the perfect ending. And Beatrix is on Christopher's lap. And she says, what would you think about adding another? Uh, person, I can't just say person, but another living thing to our menagerie. And he's like, what is it? Is it feathers, fur, scales? What is it? She goes, actually, none of those. And then she explains that he can see it in eight months and that it's already here. And he was so excited and I'm just so thrilled for them. And he's like, this is just more than I deserve. And she says, I'll tell you, I'll show you what you deserve. And then she kisses him and it's just so good. I love the ending so much. Oh, it's so great. And I just, I tell you, it was a really good ending. And when I read this book the first time, I said I'd probably give it five stars. Upon a reread, I'm probably gonna knock it down to four because again, like there was just so much about Christopher throughout that sort of bothered me that I don't think I could give it a perfect five stars. However, I'm really thrilled that he is doing so much better. And I think they're probably well suited to one another in terms of taming one another and compromise and I don't know if anybody else could handle him other than Beatrix. So it seems like she's up to the task. I'm just thrilled. But yeah, four stars, which is still good. I mean, it's good. I would read it again, and I'm sure I will. Um, and, and as I said, the song I had for them is Safe and Sound by the Civil Wars and Taylor Swift from the Hunger Games soundtrack because she helps him to feel safe and sound for sure. I thought this was a perfect song. I am so excited to start The Ravenels next week and hopefully you'll join me. It's also the first week of school, so it's gonna be kind of emotional and a little crazy, but probably less crazy than this week for her. Maybe I'll finally get over being sick too. I hope you guys are doing well and enjoying whatever it is that you're reading. Thanks for hanging out with me through this whole thing. I hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much, take care, and bye.